In this video, we'll wrap up our discussion of set operations by talking about the big union, intersection, and product notation for sets. Throughout this discussion, you're going to have to remember that the big union, intersection, and product are really just pieces of notation. They are nothing new, they are just generalizations of things that we already know about set theory, namely the union and the intersection. So the easiest way to get into the big union and intersection notation is to first start talking about things called collections of sets. So we will pretend we have some sets and let's call them A1, A2, and so on. The reason why I keep the dots running over here is because we may in some cases have an infinite number of sets. But in any case, we'll write um, this right here. So we'll use a set brackets, put AI in it, and then write I in X whatever uh, that means. And all that will represent is the set of all the AI, and we will call this a collection, right? It is a set, but we will call it a collection just to distinguish it from the sets AI. Now, our set X, I should explain, is a general way of saying the AI have to be enumerated. And what does that mean? Well, that just means that we have to be able to count the AI in some way. So here I started with one, two, but we didn't have to start with one. We could have started with zero. Um, we could have only had a finite number. We could have go, um, gone just zero, one, two, um, or we could have gone for uh, an infinite number of naturals. So for example, if my indexing set X is the empty set, we will have no AI in the collection because there is nothing in the empty set. So in particular, there cannot be an AI. Uh, and so the collection of all the AI is just going to be empty. Aside from this trivial example, we have finite cases. So if X is the set 0, 1, 2, 3, then the collection of AI for I and X is the set containing A0, A1, A2, and A3. Notice that they contain the sets, not the elements in the sets. That's going to be a really important point later on. And finally, if our set is infinite, for example, if our set is the naturals, then the collection is going to be enumerated by the naturals. So I here have A0, A1, A2, and it doesn't end because the naturals don't end themselves. So now we can talk about the big union notation. And all this does is generalizes the uh, regular union that we know. So in general, we will write big U with I in X of AI for the union of everything in the collection. So like explicitly, I've written it down here, but more compactly, this is uh, the notation that we will tend to use. Now, uh, I want to address a very common misunderstanding with this because people will often confuse the big union notation with a collection. So you may uh, wonder at first, what's the difference between the two? Well, isn't like the union of all the AI same thing as the collection of all the AI? There should not be a difference, right? Well, you can see the real difference when you start thinking about what elements of each thing are. So an element of the big union actually has to be contained in one of the AI. You can think about it like this. I'm going to draw some sets here. And let's say this is A0, A1, A2, A3. Okay, And that's all for now. Their union is everything contained across all these four little bubbles. So an element of the union would, in particular, have to be contained in one of them. Here in my example, I have it's contained in A0. On the other hand, an element of AI for I and X is, a, is one of the AI. The elements of the collection are literally the sets. So we would consider this an element. We would consider this an element. We would consider this an element, right? And the collection here only has four elements, right? It's A0, A1, A2, A3. Uh, a more concrete example that I can give is the one here that I've given where the indexing set is just 0, 1, 2, and each of the AI are just uh, sets containing two fruits. So two things I want you to notice. Apple is repeated twice, and that's not an accident. There's no reason why I can't repeat the same element across my sets. Uh, but the thing I want you to notice is that if I take the collection of AI, that's the set containing A0, A1, and A2. An apple is not an element of this set. On the other hand, the union of all the AI across X 
is this union a0, union a1, union a2. And I just collect all of the elements of the set in order to come up to this union. Notice that while I had apple twice here, I'm only repeating it once in the union. And that's just to follow the general principle that we don't repeat elements in sets. So in this case, apple is an element of the union of the AI. And so there's a little bit of a difference here. Okay? And that's something that you should really keep in mind because it's easy to mix up the union and the collection of sets. In a very similar and analogous way, we will define the general intersection of sets. And so you can think about this again as just uh, the intersection of, of all the AI. So we would write like A0, intersect A1, intersect A2, and so on. For a more concrete example, I have a, a kind of neat uh, example here that actually has its uh, roots in topology. So in my example, I'm going to define the AI by a formula. It's going to be the closed interval from negative 1 over I to 1 over I. My indexing set is going to be 1, 2, 3, and so on. So all the naturals, but without 0. And so just some examples of the AI here. I have A1, A2, and A3. Of course, this goes on. And my question now is, what is the intersection of all the AI? How can I describe that um, in a better way? So just to give you a picture here, the first set, A1, is going to look something like this. It's the closed interval, remember, so it contains 1 and negative 1. Uh, but the next one, A2, so maybe I'll just write it down here, A, uh, A1. The next one is A2, okay, and it goes up until here. And the next one is A3. And the next one's A4. And we could keep on going, right? These are just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the intersection has to be some point that is contained across all of these. Okay. So, for example, zero is clearly intersection in the intersection of all of these. Uh, you can actually verify that quite easily just by thinking about what the form of each of these sets are. They're always of the form negative 1 over i to 1 over i. And so a zero can fit very nicely in between those two. Okay, is there anything else other than zero, though? Uh, if you think about it a little, you'll probably come up to the answer no, but let's prove it. So, again, an element of the intersection has to be common to every single one of the AI. So, in particular, it must be in A1. And A1, again, contains all the numbers from negative 1 to 1, inclusive. And so now we can start our contradiction. We're going to assume that x is non-zero, and x is still in the intersection of the AI. Now, since x is not 0, it's clearly either greater or smaller than 0. And so we can just assume, because the argument will work the exact same way, that x is greater than 0. Now, the reals are what we call dense. Remember, dense uh, is something that we talked about in the, first, um, in the first live session. We showed that the rationals were dense, but it's actually true that the real numbers are dense. So in this context, we will say that for any real numbers, I need two real numbers actually, right? there is a third between them. And we use that fact here to show that there is a number between 0 and x of the form 1 over n. Okay. Now, x cannot be in the closed interval negative 1 over n to 1 over n, uh, and Remember that this is actually just going to be the set a n, where n is some natural number. Okay, so if we just think about the picture, then what that means is that if my x, let me just erase this center dot, if my x is like somewhere here and it is not zero, that means that I can find a set that is so small it doesn't contain x. Right. And the reason why I can do this is because the numbers 1 over n, as n gets very, very large, they can get very, very, very small, as small as we want, actually. There is a way to make all these ideas very precise, but we are not in an analysis course, and so we're not going to do that. So here, our intersection, we've proven, is uh, just the set containing 0. And I want to draw it to your attention that this is not the empty set. Okay? And people will often mistake this because they'll say, oh, it, it has a zero, so it must be empty. No, this set contains one element. 
and that one element is zero. Okay, zero is not nothing. Nothing is literally nothing. Zero is not nothing. The example that I've given here is actually a very special case of a more general theorem in analysis. It's called the Cantor Intersection Theorem, if you're curious. Um, and just so I don't leave you hanging, this word here, analysis, um, I don't know how much you've heard about higher level math, but this is one of the major branches uh, of mathematics. And what does it deal with? Well, in general, it deals with things like functions. It deals with the apparatus of calculus, but in a more rigorous setting. So the calculus that you'll be learning in high school is not actually very rigorous. You'll learn a lot of formulas and you'll learn how to do a lot of computations, but you won't learn how to prove very much. And this is why we have uh, the field of analysis to help us out. So to finish it off, we're going to start talking about product sets. This is a discussion that is going to extend into topology. So it's very important that we cover this as early as possible. The reason why we need to define a product set is so that we can define things like R2, which is the product of R and R. So to really nail down that definition, we're going to say that the product set A cross B is the set of all pairs AB, where little a is in big A and little b is in big B. Right? So it's going to contain all the pairs while preserving order. That's really important. The first coordinate can only have something in big A. And the second coordinate can only have something in big B. And that means that A cross B is not the same thing as B cross A. You'll notice I'm saying cross so I don't mix up with multiply. Uh, I'll call it a product, but we're not going to say times or, or multiply usually. We'll say cross uh, just to distinguish it from a regular multiplication with real numbers. Okay. So the reason why I point this out is because this is something that uh, we would expect from a multiplication on real numbers. But when we're working with a product set, right, this is different from what we usually see in real numbers. Okay. Going back to our example of R2, which we describe as R cross R, now it's very easy to see why this is the case. Because this is just the set as I've described here, this is by definition. And so x is a real number, y is a real number. What does this really mean as a space though? Because R2 we interpret it very often as a space where we can do math, right? We can choose to view R2 as literally just this set. It's just a set of pairs. But we could also view it as a space. And sometimes that's more interesting, especially when we're doing something that's more geometric like topology. So to visualize how this starts, we get a copy of R, and then what we'll do is that we will attach to each point on this copy another copy. Right? And so a coordinate in the set R2 is really just a way of picking out first a coordinate on the horizontal R. So let's say we picked out this coordinate, maybe I'll color it different. Okay. And then we have to choose a second coordinate on the second copy of R. And so that's just like a, a vertical choice. So maybe we'll choose this one, right? And that will define something in the space R2, right? And you can imagine the whole space being the set of all of these lines attached to points on, on our first copy of R. And obviously I'm leaving a lot of gaps here, but if I filled in those gaps theoretically, I'd be able to get something that's not just one dimensional, but is actually two dimensional. And that's sort of where the idea of using set theory as a gateway to talk about topology really becomes an important thing. Okay, to finish it off, we'll talk about product sets. And this is going to work very much in the same way as big union and big intersection sets. Uh, so for example, we could define the triple product to be the set of all triples A, B, C. And then of course, A is in big A, B is in big B, and C is in big C. So we'll start again with our collection of A, I with the same sort of indexing set X. And with that, we can then define the pi product, right? This is pi product notation. It is literally a giant capital pi. And this will literally mean the product of all the AI. So written very explicitly, the pi product 
of a i is equal to a, uh, let's just say a zero cross a one cross a two and so on. Of course, I haven't specified what x is here, uh, but well, let's just for this example assume that x is equal to uh, the naturals. So a more concrete example that I can give is where my x is finite and the pi product of the ai is just going to be then a1 cross a2 cross a3. If ai is equal to the interval 0, 1, now this is going to be considered as a subset of r, so it's really just a closed interval in the real numbers. Then this pi product of all three sets just becomes 0, 1 cross 0, 1 cross 0, 1. And I would like you to think about why this describes a cube in R3. So again, these are just closed intervals, right? 0, 1. And what we would like to do is that we would like to think about maybe the first product as attaching 0, 1, right? Another copy of 0, 1 to every single point on the first copy, right? Maybe I'll just draw it as a, as a straight vertical line to avoid confusion. And maybe you can see it already that this thing defines a square. And so it makes sense that if I attach another one, I don't know how I'm going to attach it. Maybe that's something you should think about. Um, it will define somehow a cube, right? So think about that and try and see if you can reason out why this pi product set is actually a geometric object that we can talk about. Okay. Uh, a more interesting uh, extension of this is being able to describe the hypercube in n dimensions. So if my enumerating set x is 1 all the way up until n, then the pi product is just going to be 0, 1, cross 0, 1, cross 0, 1, all the way up until um, the nth time where we repeat 0, 1. And this is a way of describing the hypercube in n dimensions, which is just a cube, but in higher, you know, higher dimensions, a four-dimensional, five-dimensional, n-dimensional cube. Okay, so as you can see, um, product sets are going to become very important when we start talking about topology, but they actually have a lot of use in set theory as well. And we'll start exploring this next time when we talk about uh, the Zermelo-Frankel axioms for set theory.